Okay, wonderful. I think we'll begin. I am delighted to welcome you all today to today's webinar on climate diplomacy. Uh, my name is Catherine Lester. I'm the head of the resident coordinators office here in the UAE. Um, recent months, we've seen a significant surge in climate diplomacy. We've had the UN Water Conference in March, the G20 summits in July and September. And last week, we had the UN Secretary General's Climate Ambition Summit. And of course, we cannot forget the upcoming COP28 that will take place in exactly two months here in the UAE. In this session today, we'll touch on some of the key mechanisms for climate diplomacy, as well as recent successes and challenges. We have the pleasure of colleagues joining us today from the UNFCCC, the UN Development Coordination Office, UN Economic Commission for Africa, and the Anwar Gagash Diplomatic Academy here in the UAE. Before starting with the lead presentation from UNFCCC, I'd like to invite all participants to post any questions they might have in the chat, and we'll have an opportunity at the end of the webinar to discuss these questions. So I'd like to give the floor now to Cecilia, the Director of the UNFCCC's Intergovernmental Support and Collective Progress Division for the lead presentation. Cecilia, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine, for that warm welcome. And it's indeed a great pleasure for me to be joining you from Bonn uh, to share with you some of our experiences of one of what I call the most well-established, well-developed, but most complex multilateral process within climate diplomacy. Um, I, I feel quite honoured to be part of this team. I joined the UNFCCC team about two years ago. Uh, but I had a chance to uh, engage with this process as it emerged in 1992 during the Rio, uh, con Rio conference uh, in Rio de Janeiro. And that was like was in 1992. And I recall as yet a young activist. actually, and she telling me that in order for me to answer those specific questions, that there were many people out there that were asking the same questions. And for me, the questions were uh, trying to understand how intergovernmental processes take place, why people just make statements in the room, when are they consolidated, when, are they, when do countries know that they've reached consensus, and how does this happen, and how can any other person understand this process? And in asking my questions, she actually challenged me to prepare, to ask the questions and prepare a small booklet that would guide and support women as they were trying to, uh, um, you know, working towards uh, attending the Beijing Conference of Women in China. And I did that, uh, prepared the first manual of understanding and enhancing uh, participation, broader participation of women in intergovernmental processes, and trained over 5,000 women across Africa to participate and effectively participate in the first Beijing Conference uh, of Women. So this has really been my journey, and really um, I, I come back to the process at a maturity at a level of maturity where we are now moving from the UNFCCC process as being purely negotiations to now negotiating implementation. And I'd just like to start my formal presentation with you on that note. I'm not sure uh, if if uh, Francisca uh, uh, Precious will be moving the slides or somebody else will move the slides for me. Okay. We're We're just putting it on right now. now. Yeah, I think now I have rights to share. Just okay, thanks to share. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'd just like to start off by introducing you to what the UNFCCC is. That's the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, this is a framework that was adopted uh, by parties at the General Assembly in 1992, as I mentioned. And the main objective was at that moment, there was a global recognition that there was a need for countries to work collectively to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations to a level that would prevent dangerous 
anthropogenic interferences with the climate system. And basically here we are talking about human activities that interfere with climate systems and having a re taking responsibility globally within the framework of the United Nations to manage that. And therefore, these countries that have uh, uh, you know, that have signed up to this convention, we normally call them, refer to them as parties, parties to the convention. And they operate under some specific guiding principles, which I would like to highlight here. And basically is the principle of equity, uh, the principle of common but differentiated responsibility and respect respective capabilities. And these two principles actually continue to be very central uh, to the negotiations, as well as the diplomatic processes within our, our negotiations, as well as within the UNFCCC process. And even as we come to COP28, you will see these two principles playing out again. Uh, and we have actually one particular uh, submission for an agenda item where parties and some parties feel that they would like to revisit uh, these two principles basically to see whether they are being applied effectively and whether they have had results and outcomes that would be beneficial and particularly to developing countries that are have been impacted much more by the climate change process. So the UNFCCC entered into force in 1994 and today it has nearly universal membership of 198 parties. And this also includes the Holy See. On the next slide, I would just like to elaborate what are some of the key milestones with regard to the evolution of the UNFCCC. So the UNFCCC, uh, as I said, uh, was, was, was enacted in 1992 at the Rio conference. And since then, there was a feeling that there was need to have a focus, particularly on what we call the Annex One countries. These are basically the developed uh, high emitting countries. And under them, they enacted what we call the Kyoto Pro Protocol in 1997. And the Kyoto Pro Protocol sets specific legally binding emission reduction targets for these parties. And I'll encourage you to go and look out uh, for what, what, you know, the, the, the names of this parties that are listed in Annex 1. Moving forward and fast forward, then we remember, you recall that the negotiations and the discussions within the General Assembly were moving us to a stage where we were looking at the Millennium Development Goals and there was a need, felt need to have a framework of sustainable development that integrates and incorporates uh, all parties. And therefore, in the process of the discussions and negotiations around the SDGs, we also had the negotiations and discussions about the importance of moving from negotiations to implementations across actions of adaptation and mitigation. And in 2015, the same year, the SDGs were promulgated. We have the Paris Agreement, which is a guiding framework for this process in terms of ensuring that parties decide on their own com commitments. There is a bottom-up approach in terms of identifying processes of implementation and that efforts by countries are also communicated through their nationally determined considerations, popularly known as the NDCs. So this is really an evolution of the process. And we are now looking at the three frameworks, if I may call them so, the, the convention itself, the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement as a package that allows our countries to negotiate and deliver uh, on the key ambitions around ensuring that our climate is, is safeguarded and kept under check. I would then like to take you a little bit deeper into that to look at the institutional framework and how this has been enhanced and developed to ensure you know, fuller engagement uh, and fuller, and fuller uh, and not just fuller engagement, but that the issues are addressed and encompassed in a much more comprehensive manner. And therefore, under the three governing, uh, governing frameworks, that's a conference of parties, 
the Conference of Parties Serving and Meeting under the Kyoto Protocol and the Conference of Parties Serving and Meeting under the Paris Agreement, we do have what we call the subsidiary bodies. We have two subsidiary bodies. The first subsidiary body is the one on scientific and technological advice. And then we have a second um, subsidiary body that's looking at matters of implementation, the subsidiary body for implementation, SBI. So the SUBSTA and the SBI are the secondary uh, bodies that ensure that the parties are well prepared to engage at a higher level, which is normally at the political level, which is at the conference of parties. We normally call it COP, but under COP, when you come to COP, you realize that there are three bodies that operate under the conference of parties meeting under different protocols and agreements. So, and under there, uh, following various lines of discussion and engagement, whether it's under adaptation or mitigation or on means of implementation, we do have what we also call constituted bodies. And constituted bodies, on the other hand, provide guidance and support for specific thematic areas. So you can find constituted bodies, there's the, uh, the, a constituted body on adaptation, the adaptation committee, for instance, um, on te technology, the climate technology center network, for instance, uh, a meeting under article six, uh, on the carbon markets, et cetera, et cetera. So you find a, very, a huge realm of constituted bodies that support the work of the SBs, the subsidiary bodies, and the subsidiary bodies hand over non-technical issues that require political engagement and negotiation at the higher level to the COP. So that's basically how the process operates. And this process is supported by a secretariat, which is where I work, and as our role as a secretariat is to provide support to the parties in order for them to deliver coherently and effectively through these mechanisms of their governing and subsidiary bodies, including the constituted bodies. Another element of the governance structure is the Bureau. The Bureau's role is mainly to support. It's not a decision-making body, but it's a guidance body um, which is providing direct support to the presidency, the subsidiary bodies, and it has representation from all the regions and negotiating groups of the UNFCCC. So in terms of the institutional framework, uh, we'll not uh, go into that because I've already done that. Uh, we can move forward to show you that what happens in the course of the year. So our process, as I said, is, is very dynamic. There is no day of rest. When I joined, I was like, so after the COP, will I be able to rest a little bit and wait for a few months before the next meeting? It is on a rolling basis. And because the mandates that are coming from the COP, the mandates that are coming from the subsidiary bodies have to be continuously implemented on a rolling basis. Our year is one full, packed full of activities. However, in terms of the negotiations, and like other processes that I know, such as the CBD, negotiations within the UNFCCC process only happens in two times a year. The fundamental time is in June, when we have our June session. These are the SB sessions. And this is where the subsidiary bodies meet to be able to tackle and negotiate and play their diplomacy in reaching agreement on key issues across all areas of work of the convention at a technical level and at an implementation level through the SUBSTA and the SBI. This happens in June. It's a two-week session normally held here in Bonn. Whatever issues have not been settled or completed, uncompleted work is now carried forward to the conference of parties and handed over after a week long of subsidiary body work in order for them to finalize key decisions uh, land on, 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 on various aspects. Once they do that, for those issues that they are unable to complete or those that have been mandated only to be done by the COP, they are then, after a week long of discussion, sent to the three bodies, governing bodies, uh, for their resolutions and to reach consensus 
and agree and come up with what we call the pact uh, of the COP. So during the year, it's mainly the constituted bodies that meet uh, basically to advance work, to resolve issues, or to make recommendations that would then go to the SBs or the COP in June or in December. That's really what happens throughout the year uh, for us here within the Secretariat in terms of our support to parties. So let's look at the annual climate change conference. So during the conference, when you arrive at the conference, what really happened? As I said, we would start with sessions of the Substar and SBI. So the first week is dedicated to those sessions. And now we are also have, are adding a new element to the COP as it's becoming now traditional to also have a world leaders summit also during the first week of the COP. We saw it in Glasgow. We have seen it now in Sham El Sheikh, and we are expecting to have a similar leader summit two days after the beginning of the COP, which will be dedicated to heads of state of government and other world leaders. So this would be what would happen. Then we have the sessions of the governing bodies, the COP, the CMA, and the CMP, and they have their own respective agendas that have to be agreed on. Actually, today we will be publishing and going public with the agendas of the COP. So if you're interested, you can go into our website. You will be able to see the agendas later on today of what would be discussed uh, at COP session. We also have a systematic way within our process where there is on a rotational basis, the leadership of the COP is elected. And this is basically the presidency of the COP. We have two elements here, the presidency, as well as negotiating the host country. What has emerged in the last years is that a lot of times the presidency of the COP also chooses to be the host of the COP. Like in this case, the United Arab Emirates is the president and will also be the host of COP28. And this rotates within the UN regional groups uh, this year is Asia and the Pacific. So UAE has been elected under that group. And then it rotates next year. It's expected to be the Eastern Europe group. And following that will be the Grulak group. And Brazil has already been elected by their group to host COP30 and so on and so forth. So rotation is a normal part of our process. Um, the Forum of Parties. We review the treaty implementation and the parties would take appropriate decisions with regard to the agenda that has been set for that particular COP in terms of reviewing their implementation along the three bodies. They also meet to agree on the further development of the climate change regime. And you will be seeing a lot in this COP of this year, uh, the import, one of the important and central pieces of the upcoming COP will be the global stock take, which under the Paris Agreement has been set up to assess where the world is collectively in terms of implementing the Paris Agreement. So that would be a key piece where assessment will be made and parties would agree on a way forward in order to enhance, accelerate ambition to implementing climate action. So um, I think I've said a lot about that, but just to give you a structure of what goes on in the COP, the COP is laid out in a way that three, um, three parallel aspects are happening at the same time. The first leg is around the negotiations. And these negotiations are done in a way that parties actually work around their own negotiating groups. So the Africa group of negotiators or the Asian group of negotiators would meet within their respective groups. And there are some groups that are also cross-cutting. We have, for instance, the biggest group within our negotiation process is the group of 77 and China, which has over 137 countries meeting under that group. We also have the Western European um, and other countries groups, which is also quite big. We have the European Union group. We have the... ALBA group, uh, we have the, uh, I'll ask you to look, to look them out because they, we have about 50 uh, different groups sitting together and agreeing on positions. And there are a lot of 
of, 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 of interlinkages where some countries belong to multiple groups uh, than one. Um, in the next slide, just to show you a basic geographical um, arrangement in terms of how the COP happens, assume this is the Expo Center uh, where the COP28 will be held. Within that COP area, we have designated areas where each activity would be happening and they are distinct as well as restricted uh, to the negotiators as well as other participants that would be on those processes. Although the blue zone looks like it's the biggest uh, job, uh, on that space, I'll tell you it is the smallest space. We have continued to be pushed and pushed and pushed as the demands for more and more spaces for other activities are happening within the COP itself. So the blue zone is specifically where the negotiations happen. This is an area that is well guarded. It is safeguarded. It is managed by the United Nations and it falls under the authority of the UN. And in this space, negotiations would be happening. We would be having par parallel sessions, uh, plenary sessions happening. The opening, for instance, happens in plenary. Whenever the president wants to consult all parties on certain issues, he would, for, he would call informal plenaries, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, there has to be dedicated plenary rooms and plenary halls that are adequate to be able to house all parties for any meeting that would require that plenary setting. Other negotiations mainly happen in what we call the contact groups. And these are really the places where the negotiators would be meeting and would really be going through their negotiations and be able to move towards a consensus of reaching common decisions through a consensus process. Our process is really governed by consensus. They would also be having informal, informal sessions as well as informal settings where they can negotiate, et cetera, et cetera. And it's our role as a secretariat to ensure that adequate space uh, adequate facilities are provisioned for these processes within the negotiations to happen. This year, we have been able also to open up a space for virtual participation. So although we will be giving badges to those that are coming on site uh, and participating in person in the negotiations, there would be virtual access. However, our process has still not allowed for virtual negotiations. So even though you have access for observing the negotiations, you cannot virtually uh, actively negotiate within our process. We also have spaces for media and press. We have spaces for official side events. You have to register for those events. They are vetted, they're selected, et cetera, et cetera. And there are criteria that are based, that are developed to guide this. So within the Blue Zone also now, we do have country offices and country pavilions. So these space again has have been made available. Um, and these are also spaces where countries can have their own bilateral meetings, can organize smaller meetings for themselves and the pavilions. You all, I, if, for those who have been at the COP, know it's quite an active area. We, all kinds of activities are being organized there. But again, this year, the pavilions are, been, are going to be organized in a much more transparent and manageable way. And therefore the spaces this year are slightly smaller, uh, but the UAE has gone ahead and innovated in ensuring that they create common spaces where workshops, meetings, events can happen. In this way, we will be able to know because we've received lots of questions you know, what's going on in the pavilions, you don't seem to have a hold on it. We now will be able to know exactly what activities are happening, who is at the pavilions and what they are, you know, what they are doing. We don't, we, we, we don't really uh, police them, but at least we do have a general overview of what is happening and who is at those spaces. So that's the blue zone. Access is determined by the badge. The, the, the mainly, we get national focal points at each country presenting the list of the participants that would officially be representing them at the negotiations. And it's based on those lists from the national focal points 
that people are barged, uh, delegates are barged to be able to access the blue zone. We then have the green zone. And this is where I say where the real action happens. This is where the observers are. This is where you have all kinds of activities, workshops, dynamic music, dance, cultural events, etc., happening at that area and exhibits, etc. So this is a green zone, and this is also managed under the realm and organization of the host country. So the UAE, in the case of uh, COP28, is responsible for organizing that space. But we also know that just like the anger that's just ended, there are a lot of site events, side events that happen off-site. And these mainly is to make connections to what's going on um, perhaps get some of the negotiators or some of the leaders or some of the observers also participating and in, in a way trying to influence the uptake of the process. So these again, we recognize them. We do not we do not manage those, but it's always good for us to know what's also going on around the COP itself. So let me just give you a glimpse of what happens just before the start of the COP. There's a range of meetings that happen. As I mentioned, our negotiation process is quite controlled and negotiations only happened in two, in two parts of the year, in June and in November, December. But prior, so prior to the COP itself, we have what we call a precessional meeting. And that precessional meeting allows the negotiating groups to have a chance to meet face to face and by then, the constituted bodies have met, the SBs have been held. Many negotiating groups will have had their own informal meetings. They now have a chance just before the COP to consolidate their positions. So it is at these meetings where they identify the areas of convergence or the areas of divergence and their expected landing zones on some of their negotiating positions. So these basically, we provide again the space for this, uh, we structure them. We've done it over the years. We know which groups would overlap with which, and therefore we arrange it in a way that there are no overlaps or groups are not able to meet. Because as I said, some countries belong to numerous groups. The group of 77, for instance, you'll find people that belong to the LDC group, the Africa group of negotiators, GRULAC, et cetera, et cetera. So we manage it in a way to ensure that we provision that space for them to be able to consolidate in order for us to have a much more efficient and successful meeting. So what do we do as a secretariat? We facilitate the intergovernmental process. We facilitate the process of negotiation. We maintain the relationship and manage the relationship between ourselves and the negotiating groups. And that's vital for diplomacy. We also support the complex architecture of our bodies. As you saw, it's quite complex and the interlinkages and the need for coherence and the messaging is quite critical. As a secretariat, we also provide technical expertise and we assist the parties to do analytics, to review the climate change information that's reported by parties, whether it's through the NDCs, through the NAPs and through the BTRs or other frameworks. We do the synthesis of this kind of reports and we present it back to the parties for their, for their own purposes of negotiating positions as well as for their information. We also are supporting processes of implementation. And you may well know that we have established what we are calling the regional climate centers in order for us to be closer to parties and closer to our stakeholders. And we do have one already uh, located uh, in Dubai which is serving the Asia and the Pacific region. We also maintain the registry of nationally determined contributions, which was established under the Paris Agreement, as well as we organize and support negotiating sessions that are held in the, in the, during the course of the year, not necessarily at COP or at the SB. Um, we also organize the sessions of the COP uh, and the large number of meetings and workshops. For instance, last year, we had over 172 workshops and meetings happening the same time. I've not done the count yet now. We are still consolidating, but I can tell you there'll be numerous. Just scheduling them, ensuring there are no overlaps uh, is one of the jobs that we do on a daily basis 
to ensure the success and efficiency of the conference delivery. So I'd like to show you a glimpse of what happens in the year. I said we don't rest. And there is a graphic, I hope you're seeing that, that's demonstrating what we are doing. The other meetings that are related and linked, for instance, we were fully engaged in UNGA, uh, in UNGA the last week, mainly because there was a mandate from parties for the Secretary General to organize a climate ambition summit and also on its sidelines to really organize a session on the global stock take. So we find that even meetings such as the G20, meetings of the G7, meeting of the BRICS, et cetera, becoming now more interrelated to our process, mainly because their conclusions, their declarations are speaking to the UNFCCC process. So we are keeping tab of what comes out of these processes, which are now there represented by the UN blue color, and also looking at the UNFCC mandates as they're emerging, and our mandates are increasing, ever increasing, or uh, every year that we have a COP. So again, making those interlinkages and connections and keeping the UNFCCC, whether it's through the CMA or the CMP or the COP, you know, really at the core of all these processes and ensuring that the, we are being more coherent. So I talked about the process support that we are providing, but we also have major uh, other processes and meetings and policy meetings that are of relevance to this process. Some are very, we, you know, we really categorize them as technical level meetings, and these would be connected to other processes dealing with water, with forests, with oceans, for instance. But we also have others that are very much related to the political level. So having that harmonious balance between technical and political is a role that we are playing continuously to ensure that the UNFCCC process remains fit for purpose in terms of addressing a global uh, challenge of our times. So I've already mentioned what this, what this, what we do as the secretariat. I will not uh, go back to that, uh, but also talk a little bit about our rules of procedure because these are really what governs us. So every diplomatic process will essentially have at its core its own rules of procedure. And that's what really guides the president uh, as he manages uh, the sessions, whether it's in plenary or it's in, whether it's, he's running the, his own informal sessions, he has to be guided by the rules of procedure. And these are normally adopted before the start of each session. In our process, uh, we have never been able to fully adopt uh, the rules of procedure mainly because we have a disagreement on a draft rule 42, which is on voting. And basically this is not voting for electoral positions. For instance, the chair of the SBI or the chair or the president, this is really with regard to the substance. And there has, this has continued to be contentious issue. And as you can understand, you know, uh, negotiating climate is quite not easy. You will recall in Glasgow, you know, reaching an agreement of facing out coal and facing down fossil fuel subsidies was one of the most difficult decisions that the president had to gavel. And therefore, this issue has remained uh, contentious and therefore we always adopting the rules of procedure without that draft rule 42 on voting for the time being. Um, Precious, I'd like to move to the to move forward, just to talk a little bit about decision making by consensus. I spoke about this. Uh, the lack of agreement, basically, on that rule, is the main issue where most of our agreements and processes must be agreed on by consensus. And therefore, if there is no consensus, the issue will automatically. We, we apply rule 16, which actually requires that that issue be either car be carried forward to the next COP or be closed, you know, and not be discussed thereof. So again, you know, consensus is not easy. It requires a set of skills in diplomacy. And therefore, what we do, like throughout the process and what will be happening between now and COP, 
even reaching a consensus on the agenda in our process, it has become quite dramatic. So the presidency from today, when we publish the, uh, the agenda, he will start his consultations. So we don't wait for the COP to start and then start building consensus around the, around the agenda. Consensus building starts now. Shuttle diplomacy starts now. We already know where the contention will be, and therefore we lay out a strategy and we support the presidency in order for them to ensure that our process, which is based on consensus, remains legitimate, remains transparent, and it allows us to, uh, to, re to reach an outcome that would be more suitable uh, for addressing the climate challenge. So, th so really that's what I wanted to emphasize there. Um, I spoke about the negotiating forums and the different formats. I'll ask you to read that a little bit uh, because it's quite different, extremely different from other negotiating process. Everybody kept, kept asking me if it's an informal, informal, why should this be restricted? Why can I not go? Because it's an informal meeting. So it's good for you to understand within the UNFCCC process, informal informals don't mean that it's in, they are not they do not refer to informality, but the, it does refer to other aspects and elements um, of our negotiating process and how they would be conducted. Perhaps the president, the, the chair, or the president has set a, has asked a smaller group. Actually, not the president in this case. The co-facilitator of the negotiating group would meet, perhaps ask certain parties to meet, discuss, and agree on an issue that has reached us, that is in a, in a stalemate, for instance. Then he would call for an informal informal uh, to be set up where the negotiators would go to a room and start trying to resolve that issue. Okay, um, let me see where I am in terms of time so that I have quite a number of slides and I can see. Um, so let me see, uh, which other slide I can go to because we've quite a lot of information. And I'd like to go maybe, uh, Precious, if we could go to the road to COP28. So the UNFCC process, um, and basically I'm coming to sum up my presentation uh, from a very high level perspective. It's basically the coming together of parties to stop the climate crisis. But it is structured in nature. As I said, it is structured before the Paris Agreement. There were two broad elements. There is the issue of negotiating around mitigation and adaptation. There is a feeling as we move towards COP28 that more attention needs to be given to adaptation and where it comes to implementation, that adaptation is lagging behind. Developing countries are not managing to receive the support that is required even under the means of implementation, whether it's capacity development, whether it's finance, or whether it is technology transfer. So there is a big drive as we move to COP28 that a lot of negotiations will be talking about the importance of placing more focus on adaptation. And you may hear here and there the whole call for doubling finance for adaptation. On the other hand, there is a feeling, and I believe just justifiable, that from Glasgow and, and now, we seem to have lost some traction on the whole issue of mitigation. So there will be an increased and enhanced call uh, for a key focus on mitigation action and seeing how we can ramp up um, and accelerate uh, implementation towards uh, the mitig mitigation aspects. So COP27 focused and moved us to focusing much more on implementation. Uh, and in COP27, there was an agreement to establish the loss and damage funding arrangement mechanism. And what we are expecting now in COP28 is that the focus, as the presidency has said, would be more on action. And when we look at the loss and damage funding arrangement, 
that negotiators meeting and political leaders meeting would be focusing of not only agreeing on the governance structure of the loss and damage funding mechanism, but we'd also be looking at how to liquidate that funding arrangement. Where is the money and how does that money get in? I think other aspects of negotiations that would be happening would, of course, be around uh, meeting oblig financial, historic financial obligations. 13 years ago, the commitment for by parties from developed countries to ensure that 100 billion would be available for climate change action. There is a feeling that this has not been met, and therefore a lot of negotiations and diplomacy that would be going on in the corridors would be how do we rebuild the trust? You know, so again, this is what will really be happening in the corridors and a lot of trading uh, would be happening in terms of looking backwards, but also looking forwards. Looking forward, a central element, as I mentioned at COP28, will be negotiating the first global stock take. Where are we in terms of collectively reaching there? Do we look backward, what has not been delivered, or do we look forward and make some sectoral developmental pathways that would get us to where we want to be, either on adaptation or mitigation, but also ensure that the central core of the means of implementation is availed and what needs to be done, including the current discussion around the restructuring or the review of the financing mechanisms, including the international funding institutions. So the whole idea of how can we cost correct what we did not achieve in the last five years, where are the gaps, where are the challenges, but more importantly, where are the opportunities that would lead us to more robust NDCs in 2025. Next year, we are looking at the new quantified goal on finance, where do we work around that in enhancing that a process and finally getting us um, to the level where we will have a robust outcome. Will it be a declaration from COP28? Will it be a decision? Will it be a technical annex, et cetera, et cetera? So that's where we are in terms of the negotiations so far. But I just wanted to also highlight to you that our process has become uh, very, very um, important even to stakeholders across the world and observers. And in the last 30 years, we have grown from observer organizations um, that were participating were only 177. And in the last four years, this has grown up to 3,235 observer organizations that are part of our process. And these are just numbers of the observer organizations. In terms of numbers, we are also seeing the observers surpassing the number of government or party-led participants within our COP. So that process now has required us to relook on how we manage the COPs in order to ensure that we do have a balance um, in terms of our support and in managing that process. Um, the other and I'd like to highlight is the UNFCC e-learning courses. There's a slide, I hope, uh, Precious, you have the slide on. And this would be really uh, encouraging all of you uh, to really go into this guides, go into the process. We have a participant guide uh, on the UN climate change process. We do have uh, implementation and compliance committee have produced some guidance, some courses. Uh, and you can view the syllabuses for each of these elements uh, on this platform. So thank you very much, uh, Catherine. I've taken more time than you had allocated me, uh, but I hope you found our presentation uh, valuable and useful. Thanks. Uh, Cecilia, you're so welcome. Thank you so, so very much for that. I've just looked it up and it's 64 days until the COP. So for you to have had time to come and brief us today, we really, really appreciate it. These are the fundamentals of what we're all preparing for day to day. So um, we really appreciate this. In the interest of time, I'm just going to pass over now immediately to Porti, who leads the Climate, Environment and Food Systems Portfolio at the UN Development Coordination Office in New York. 
to convey some of her first-hand impressions of the Secretary General's Climate Ambition Summit last week. Porty, over to you. Thank you so much, Catherine, and thank you, Cecilia, for that rich and informative uh, presentation. I've been going to COPS for a few years, uh, but I've never seen the whole process laid out in that incredible way. So thank you. I, I certainly learned a lot. Uh, I just wanted to take a few minutes to go over um, my impressions from the Secretary General's Climate Ambition Summit, which Cecilia referred to earlier. Uh, it took place one week ago uh, today in New York. Um, and actually, the Secretary General had evidently convened this summit at the mandate of the parties from the UNFCCC to inject momentum in the global climate action uh, generally. Um, and he had done so around uh, an acceleration agenda, which he had published in the run up, um, which recognized that, you know, not enough is being done on both climate mitigation as well as climate adaptation. Um, and so he had very specific asks of leaders, both from national governments, but also other leaders like economic leaders, um, sub-national authorities, on what they could do to indicate that they're willing to do more on mitigation to inject some momentum. For example, setting net zero target dates very precisely, energy transition plans, updated NDCs, uh, which Cecilia mentioned by 2025, economy-wide and absolute emission cuts on NDCs and so on. But likewise on the adaptation, uh, focusing on early warnings for all, uh, adaptation finance and um, loss and damage specifically. Um, so what was very interesting, I think, about the SG summit is he chose to limit the number of speakers and asked for only the most ambitious announcements. Effectively, he set a price for entry to the summit and only the most amb ambitious announcements would uh, get uh, coverage would be would be allowed to be kind of made on the world stage. And so there was this reputational gain um, that was being offered as a carrot for for those who wanted to speak. And so sitting there on the morning of the summit, uh, uh, clearly this this had worked, but the, there were only 34 speakers in the morning, uh, which featured the early movers, the leaders that are really willing to do a lot on the acceleration agenda, willing to shift the needle. And we could see that some of these commitments were indeed responding to the acceleration agenda. I, I won't go into all of those uh, now. Um, actually, Soraya could kindly help to put the um, chair's summary in the chat, which gives an overview of all of the announcements made uh, uh, last week, and you can go through them. But we certainly saw a few leaders uh, responding to this acceleration agenda, uh, many of them committing to the GCF replenishment, uh, the, the Green Climate Fund, which is really important on the mitigation side, especially countries like Can Canada um, giving give big signals on uh, fossil fuel subsidy phase out. Uh, clearly, consensus emerging uh, under the leadership of Dr. Sultan, uh, together with EU and a few other uh, key leaders, on um, uh, committing to tripling renewable energy and doubling energy efficiency by 2030. So this could be a big outcome by COP28. But sitting in the room, what was very clear, was kind of palpable in the air, is there were not many G20 countries that were there making those big announcements. And as we know, the G20 um, uh, uh, emits 80% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And so we really need the G20 countries uh, to be uh, the ones kind of leading the way. Um, and yet, at the same time, uh, we saw other types of leaders still standing up. Uh, and I think this really struck me throughout the day that we had uh, actors like cities, mayors, um, governors of regions, uh, CEOs of major multinational companies standing up there and making those announcements. So in the morning, w while just a few hours before the UK government had sort of signal that is going to renege on its existing commitments. We still had the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, uh, standing up there at the summit saying, regardless, uh, he's committing to net zero uh, for the city of London. Um, and this is significant because we know that cities account for 70 to 75 percent of uh, global greenhouse gas emissions. So these wider stakeholders, the ecosystem of actors uh, standing up and showing their own ability to shift the policy and implementation needle uh, was really, really significant, I felt, in, in the summit. And you saw that throughout the day in the afternoon, especially, which discussed uh, things like credibility standards for such voluntary commitments as made especially by non-state actors, um, concrete efforts on climate justice, such as on early warnings for all or adaptation, um, and uh, coalitions of actors of all different types 
coming together to decarbonize specific sectors, uh, as Cecilia mentioned, uh, especially hard to abate sectors like uh, uh, steel or cement. Uh, so what my big takeaway was like the emerging, uh, not just the emerging, the kind of exploding importance of the ecosystem of actors. The UNFCCC is, uh, you know, oriented around national governments, and that's absolutely central and vital. They continue to be core to this equation. But even as Cecilia showed, the, the wider ecosystem is important. And that became really, really clear um, in, in the SG summit. And, and the ability of the wider ecosystem to maybe nudge countries and national governments to become more and more ambitious was clear there as well. And so looking forward, I really see that as, um, as vital. We need to nurture the wider ecosystem, uh, especially if the G20 countries are going to get more ambitious. So just sitting from where I, uh, I looking at from where I'm sitting here in UNDCO, we support UN country teams and the resident coordinator offices all over the world. I really see the role of the UN system as as vital in that it's building trust, um, trust not just between governments, but ch trust between unlikely bedfellows of you know governments and civil society actors, uh, CEOs and indigenous peoples, mayors uh, and governors. Uh, so, and as the UN system, as RCs and UN country teams, but also at HQ, we're natural arbiters. We have also significant convening power that we should be using uh, to bring together all of these different actors and kind of chore choreograph uh, a, a collective dance, if you will, of these actors coming together uh, in, in cultivating this race to the top that the Secretary General uh, talked about. Um, I know we're very late on time, so I'll I'll just stop there with my impressions. Thank you. Orti, thank you so, so much. And um, thank you so very much as well, noting how early it is in the early hours of New York time. So your articulate reflections are really welcome. Thank you. Um, I'd like to now pass the floor to Mustafa Beumi. Uh, congratulations on the recently set up Centre for Climate Diplomacy at the Anwar Gagash Diplomatic Academy uh, for your reflections. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to to join you all. Um, uh, conscious of time, so I'll I'll keep my comments very brief. And I think uh, Cecilia and Pudi already did a very good job, uh, kind of covering most of the points that I also want to touch upon. Um, so I'll be very brief and in three main points, and then happy to to expand on them in the Q and A, of course. Uh, my first point is maybe coming from a bit of a different angle. Is that um, I think there is a need to recognize that there is a science policy gap when it comes to uh, climate diplomacy, and so basically there is a discrepancy between what the science is telling us and what is being negotiated and the outcomes that we have uh, so far. And so um, uh, related to what you just mentioned, the center that we uh, just launched. So at the academy, one of our tasks is to train current and future diplomats. Um, and, and when it comes particularly to climate diplomacy, uh, what we're trying to do is not start with them with, with the negotiations. We actually start with them with the physical science because we think it's a foundation. It's very, very important to know and understand what are they negotiating on and what, what is at stake. Um, and so this is one of the things that we are doing. Um, and then another thing that we're also trying to push forward with the with the center that we just launched is to continuously communicate the best science and the latest research outcome uh, with the relevant government entities, um, but also even broadly in the region. Um, and I think this is a, a very important step to, to bridge the gap uh, that I just mentioned. And then my second point is um, uh, actually related to some of the points that were just mentioned and related to the SDGs as well. And th it's that some actors still think of, of tackling the climate challenges in silos, uh, which is something that we cannot really do anymore. Um, I mean, from recent studies, we, we now know that six out of the nine planetary boundaries has been uh, crossed. And so we need to kind of find the synergies um, and what kind of action can actually help us, um, you know, kind of tackle multiple challenges uh, at the same time? Um, and and since um, uh, environmental issues and, and climate change particularly is my area of expertise, I would even go further and argue that that climate and biodiversity 
um, will probably be the basis of our our policies and diplomacy for generations to come. And so we have to think of those two together, but also broadly on how to bring other um, uh, sustainable development goals and also try to tackle multiple challenges at the same time. And then my last point is related to something uh, actually uh, Cecilia uh, touched upon in terms of moving from just negotiations to uh, implementation. I think we're in a desperate need for solidarity um, at the next COP. There's um, there's some sort of growing skepticism of what we can actually achieve through uh, climate diplomacy and negotiations. Um, and I, I've been observing the the, the process for uh, quite a while now, and we've seen progress, but I don't think the progress is at the same pace that is actually uh, needed. And the result of that is um, the, the, the general public is kind of losing trust in what we can actually deliver from, from diplomacy. Um, and so I, I really think that, the, for example, the climate summit that just ended, those type of events are very important, like what he said, because those, they, they kind of create trust again, um, uh, whether not just for the governments, but also with civil society and the general public. Um, and I, I would say that we have to engage at COP28 with a spirit of collaboration so that we can actually revise this kind of trust, whether in the process or uh, uh, in the negotiations overall. Thank you so very much for those remarks, Mustafa, and, and to all our speakers today for such rich content. Um, just to reiterate that this recording will be on our YouTube channel. I think if we can indulge our speakers for a few more minutes, um, we do have a little bit of time for a few questions. Uh, I note that there was one in the chat, Cecilia, on how the UNFCCC, the Secretariat, will be present at MENA Climate Week. Uh, perhaps if we can ask you to speak to that. And then Mustafa, I think there's a question for you as well. Cecilia? Yes, I'm trying to find the question. Um, I, I think it's just about the FCCC at MENA Climate Week. Perhaps okay. what to expect. Yes. <laughs> okay. No, yes, um, we just finished the Africa Climate Week a couple of weeks ago the MENA Climate Week from the 7th, we will have a huge delegation there, including our executive secretary. Uh, there will be a couple of high level events that happen during the first day of the conference and then uh, thematic uh, areas uh, that would tracks which would be organized. Uh, Precious, I don't know whether you remember the four uh, thematic tracks, uh, it's as you know, the Regional Climate Week is organized uh, in collaboration with other UN agencies, uh, UNDP, uh, the Eco Economic Commission for the region, uh, the World Bank, um, and I think several ILO and several others. So basically what would happen is in the first day, the high level e events uh, happen. And then after that, we go into different tracks and the tracks are organized around thematic areas. And I'd kindly request Precious to, to just post uh, those thematic tracks just for information. Yes, I'll post to them, post yeah. them in the chat. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Um, Mustafa, perhaps if you could respond to the question, does the UAE government offer scholarship opportunities for climate action practitioners to participate in the next COP? So perhaps I guess the broader question is about support to, to engage and participate in the COP process. Um, so I, I think Cecilia touched upon the point that uh, the UAE has efforts to make this the most inclusive COP. Um, and I think part of that effort was the youth delegates uh, program. Um, however, unfortunately, I think this uh, the application for this has already closed. I'm sure there will be many other opportunities. Um, and if it's uh, scholarships particularly, then um, the UAE now has a universities climate network, which is a large group of universities that are putting together their efforts in terms of research, in terms of scholarship, in terms of uh, activities at the COP. And I think uh, uh, there might be much more information uh, on the website. Thank you so very much. I think it's just gone three o'clock UAE time. 
So again, I'd really like to say thank you, Cecilia, especially to Porti, to Mustafa for your time today and to colleagues for listening in. Please join us next week for our webinar on protecting children's rights in a changing climate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much and bye-bye. Bye-bye.